Good morning, folks. Welcome to the Silicon Valley Health Institute. We are a nonprofit organization and we aim to bring the best leading world's experts on health issues right into your living room. We want to give you information so you can make good decisions and maybe we can have input into our various governments so we can have healthy lives and get, be on the path toward optimal health. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization. If you want to be on our email list, uh, private message me. And, or you go to a website and join, it's www.svhi, as in Silicon Valley Health Institute. Today, we're very lucky to have some of the original researchers on genetically modified foods. I mean, we've got Michael Antonio, and he's been researching this at King's College for a long time. He's had input to various movies and books, and so he's one of the experts and original researchers, and Claire Robinson as well. They've both done extensive research and have published on GMO and herbicides. Claire Robinson is an editor at GM Watch, and a news, which is a news and public information service on issues related to genetic modification. She was formerly the research director at the sustainability nonprofit Earth Open Source and is co-author of the book, GMO Myths and Truths. She has a background in research, writing, and the communication of topics related to public health, science, policy, and the environment. Michael Antonio um, is a reader in molecular genetics and the head of the Gene Expression and Therapy Group at the Department of Medical and Molecular Genetics at King's College London School of Medicine in the UK. He holds inventor status on gene expression and biotechnology patents. They will talk about genetically modified foods. You can ask questions by raising your hand and uh, on the Zoom apparatus. And we'll have them talk about GMOs and, uh, and you know, talk about genetic modified foods, the, the health involved, and how it affects our health. So welcome, Claire and Michael. Pleasure to be Thank here. Thank you. Tell us about genetically modified foods. Should we be concerned? I mean, they're everywhere, so, and they're probably cheap. I mean, Bill Gates is probably pushing this, so we'll all have them, you know, in every cardboard container we open. So tell us, is that an okay thing? Should we be concerned? Well, I've, I've been outspoken on this topic since the mid 1990s. And right from the beginning, I know I thought GM, uh, crops, foods, GMO crops and foods were not a good thing at all. Um, looking at it from my background as a molecular geneticist that studies gene organization and function and developing biotech tools on that basis, I realized very early on that the use of genetic modification in crop production was not really being presented in a, what I would call, a fully truthful uh, manner. Um, it was always touted as being very precise uh, with the outcomes totally predictable and therefore the products completely safe. But using the same types of technologies that are being used in crop, GM crop development, but in my case, in a research and clinical context, I knew that Actually, that wasn't uh, the case. The reason for that is, is that really, if I'm to summarize the procedure and the outcome of, of GM techniques, including the recent gene editing, gene edited versions of GM that I hope we'll get onto later on in our discussion here today, I knew that GM brings about new combinations of gene functions. And as a result, many of these alterations in gene function in the plant are unpredictable. You're altering the, fun the, the, the function of multiple gene systems and not just the one you're intended to change or one you've added into the crop. And this alteration in the pattern of gene function will inevitably change the biochemistry of the food, the crop. 
and this altered biochemistry, because it's unpredictable, you don't know what it's going to be in advance of your manipulation, always runs the risk of producing this altered biochemistry, always run the, runs the risk of producing novel toxins and novel allergens, in addition to whatever intended change you may wish to uh, bring about in the crop and the food. So that's point number one about GM, GM crops. There are consequences stemming directly from the genetic modification, the GM transformation process. The procedure is one is not fully in control of the outcomes from the procedure you're using. So therefore, and so straight away, I knew that all these claims of precision, predictability, and safety are simply not supported by the science that underpins this technology. The second um, source of possible um, risk, health risk, from GM production of GM foods is from the GM gene itself, the product of the, uh, the in other words, the intentional alteration that you have introduced into the crop, especially when you're adding a new gene function, which is what happened in these the old style, first generation, what we call transgenic GM crops, where you're adding a foreign gene from normally a completely unrelated organism, bacterium, virus, unrelated plant into the crop. This, the product of this transformation procedure, the, the gene product, the, uh, the product of the gene that you've introduced in to make the GM crop could be, also have health consequences. The classic example here, of course, is the um, the introduction of genes that encode for a, a toxin called BT toxin, which is, has insecticidal, insect killing properties. But this can have consequences for the consumer in, in ways that we know, can guess, but also un unexpected ways as well. First and foremost, we know that BT toxin is highly immunogenic. It stimulates a very potent immune response in the animal or and presumably also the human, because no one's looked in humans, but certainly in animal studies, BT toxin elicits a very potent immune response. And uh, this could lead to allergies or other disturbances of, of uh, in the immune system of the an animal. And How so, about the microbiome? Does it have effects on that too? Unknown. Good question. Uh, it has unknown effects on the microbiome. But, but I suspect that because it has insect killing properties, to my mind, that certainly suggests that the microbiome might be affected. And this is something that should be looked at. Mm, definitely. And the third, third aspect of GM crops that we need to worry about is the fact that just about everything that's grown at the moment has been engineered to tolerate application of one or more herbicides in particular glyphosate-based herbicides. But we now have, as you know, we have crops out there in American fields that are tolerant to not just glyphosate, but to dicamba and 2,4-D, and as well as a spectrum of others, mesotrion, asoxaflutol, and, uh, and the like. So we, we are basically, what's happened with the introduction of herbicide tolerant GM crops is that our exposure to these herbicides, these toxins, basically, remember these are all toxins. Um, our exposure to them, our ingestion on a daily basis from them has simply gone up. And the consequences of this, again, are poorly explored. But we know from animal studies, coming back to where do we have the evidence of potential harm from these, uh, from GM foods, we have animal feed, controlled laboratory animal feeding studies of GM corn, of GM soy, in particular these two feeds that taken together show evidence of harm from all three or a combination of all three of, of the points that I just raised. Unexpected toxicity from the GM procedure itself, 
which causes disruption of normal gene function. The toxicity from the foreign gene product. And lastly, from the associated chemicals, the herbicides in particular, that the GM crops are, are growing, growing with. We have good controlled laboratory animal feeding studies that point to toxicity from one or more of these sources, particularly affecting liver function, kidney function, digestive system problems, and immune system uh, disturbances as well. So we're just talking about, let's just look, there's a couple of components there. There's the herbicides and glyphosate, which is everywhere. We'll get to that later. Let's just talk about the component, just the genetic modification, because people say, well, over time, genes modify naturally anyway. So what's the concern? Um, so let's just talk about the health risk, just the genetic modification itself. Yes. Well, this is a very good point. Uh, Susan, the, the point is, is that during natural reproduction, you know, the genes uh, within an organism, they're, they're all, what you're doing is you're shuffling around genes within the same gene pool, within a limited gene pool. And yes, variations on genes uh, are there in different varieties. And, uh, and when we cross plants, we exchange these different variants on, variants on genes but they're very much within the same gene pool. And these genes within the pool, the gene pool of the, of say the crop, they've evolved to work as a family, as an integrated network uh, in a harmonious manner over their evolutionary history. And this is an important point I want, want to make at this point, which is that no gene works in isolation in any organism. Genes work as part of an incredibly sophisticated network. This is the point. Genes work as a network. And the products of genes at the protein level also, they work as a network as well. That means things are interconnected. And in order for that, uh, for the organism to maintain its health, that network of gene function and that network of products of genes have to work in a balanced, harmonious manner. Changing one gene in the network can have major repercussions in the functioning of the genetic network. If you add a gene or take a gene away, the network gets disturbed in unpredictable ways. And this is where we run the risks with GM technologies, where either we add a gene or tweak the functioning of a gene, reduce its level of expression or increase its level of expression or completely eliminate the function of a gene. This alters the network in an unpredictable way such that the biochemistry of the plant will always be changed in some way or another, which you cannot predict in advance. Yes, you may get the outcome you want, but it's going to be buried within a alteration in the biochemistry of the plant, a bigger alteration in the biochemistry of the plant that you have no control over. And within that context, there are, there are not insignificant risks of producing novel toxins and allergens. Why do I say that? Because plant biochemistry is incredibly complex. They may look simpler than you or I, but actually plants are incredibly sophisticated creatures in their own right. And their biochemistries are incredibly complex. And plants are actually very good at producing toxins. Plants produce toxins naturally to defend themselves against pests and pathogens. So there you have the foundation that if you alter the biochemistry of a plant, you can unexpectedly produce a novel toxin or increase the levels of a toxin that's already there. Can you give us some example? Can you give us some examples of how these have gone, of things that have happened by just doing the genetic modification and that uh, had adverse effects? The, the, we know that the, there have been some, unfortunately not very many, but some studies that have compared the composition of the GMO plant, say corn, 
with its equivalent non-GM parent at a very deep biochemical compositional level. My laboratory has also conducted such a study, which we published back in 2015, where we compared the composition of a variety of GM corn that was engineered by Monsanto to be tolerant to being sprayed with Roundup glyphosate herbicide. And we found, and we compared it to an, an, it's a near, the nearest non-GM equivalent that we could find. And we found major changes in the composition of this GM core in terms of its protein profile and also its bi small molecule biochemical components as well. How about and, the uh, phytotoxin changes that are normally found in plants? They have a certain profile which naturally tends to upregulate when they run into their disease or their pest that they're trying to yeah. uh, mitigate. And have you seen upregulation of phytotoxins from the GM process itself? What, we, what we've seen is uh, higher levels of two substances in particular. Um, in Michael's study called uh, cadaverine and putrescine. And these compounds, bizarrely enough, are associated with the smell that you get off dead bodies. I don't know what significance that has to health, but um, it's possible that, that these substances, when they're ingested, do have some kind of biological effect. Mm. And that has really not been looked at. That's, that's true, and others in another study conducted by some Italian scientists where they look, where they compared a GMO corn uh, with BT toxin gene. So it, a B, uh, so it was a BT toxin variety of GMO corn. And they found, uh, again, major changes in the protein composition of the GMO compared to its non-GM parent. And one of those components was the uh, expression of a, of a protein called zane. This zane, was not, is, wasn't there before, you know, in the parent, it was absent. And yet here it was in the GMO, and we know Zane is a known allergen. So here you have an example of a potential allergen suddenly appearing in a GMO corn variety that wasn't, wouldn't, shouldn't, or wouldn't normally be there. And, and just to come back, in the animal feeding studies with GMO corn, whether it's the, uh, glyphosate torrent variety or the BT toxin variety, there have been some pretty damning uh, health, negative health outcomes in, in, the, in the animals in these studies, particularly in liver and kidney function. Now, the studies haven't gone far enough to say what aspect of the GMO is causing the negative health effect. The, the, the results of the study clearly point the finger at the GMO. There's something wrong with the GMO. But what aspect of the GMO the studies haven't or haven't been able actually in many instances, many instances to go deeply enough to figure out which component. It could have been the GM process induced production of toxicity. It could be the BT toxin. It could be the glyphosate or the combination of all of these. Um, of all of these components. And there's, there's also um, a study which you may have heard about because it kind of set the world alight at the time. <laughs> this was in the 1990s and it was, I think probably the first um, uh, toxicity study on a GM food that was intended for commercialization. And this was a GM potato that was engineered to be insecticidal. So it had a, an insecticide built into the potato. And the research was led by uh, a scientist, very eminent scientist called Dr. Arpad Pushtai. And uh, he did this research and he actually designed his study in a very brilliant way. This is not normally done. Um, Pushtai did it this way because he, he is a very good scientist. So he wanted to know whether the uh, substance that was engineered, the insecticidal substance that was engineered into the potato was um, a toxin in itself or whether it only became a toxin once it was genetically engineered into the potato, if you see what I mean. 
So um, he actually designed his experiment to see if that particular toxin um, was actually toxic to the rats that were fed in this experiment. And then he also fed them um, the potatoes that had this toxin engineered into them. And he had a control group that, that was just fed normal potatoes, the parent line potatoes, before the genetic modification. And to his absolute shock, what he found was that the insecticidal protein itself um, was not toxic to mammals. It was not toxic to these rats. But once that substance, that insecticide, had been engineered into the potato, then it became toxic. And it's very mysterious as to why this is. Uh, Pushtai didn't know why it was. He said, this is a, a subject for future researchers to look at. Um, actually, the tragedy is that no future researchers ever looked at this question because uh, the wrath of two governments, the UK government and the US government combined, came down upon Arpad Pushtai. He was fired from his job, his research was shut down. Um, he had strange burglaries at his lab and his house where all his data was stolen. And uh, basically he was fired from his job and he could not continue that research and nobody else dared look at the same question ever again. So we don't really know what it was about the genetic modification that made those potatoes toxic. The potatoes themselves were destroyed, so um, nobody can go back at, and, and look at what it was in those potatoes. But uh, that was an example of a GM yes. crop just being toxic because it was GM. Absolutely, this is an excellent example there from Claire that points to the, the finger clearly at the GM process. Something about the procedure of genetic mod modifying had altered the biochemistry of these potatoes in still unknown ways. Oh, and by the way, in case you're wondering, potatoes do have a natural toxin, as we know, it's called aminoglycosides. But it turns out that the GM potatoes had even less aminoglycoside than the parent. So it couldn't have been an increase in the natural toxin. Something new was generated to the GM, through the GM process and to this day, we don't know what that is because of the, the political shutdown and, uh, and destruction of material of the whole program. Didn't Pustai initially kind of think GMOs were fine and he didn't expect to yeah. find yeah. anything? That's right, yeah. very much so. Yeah, he started out as an enthusiast for GM crops. He thought that they could solve a lot of our problems in food and farming. Uh, so the results that he got absolutely shocked him. Mm. And by the way, he, he did get some results that he didn't dare go public with because he said people wouldn't believe them. And one of them was that he actually found that the brains of the rats fed the GM potatoes shrank in comparison to the, uh, to the, 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 uh, the controls. So um, this mystified him and he said, I'm not going to publish that because nobody will believe me. What other things did he find that he has not shared with us? Oh, that I don't know. Well, in the one publication that he eventually did put out with a colleague, Stanley Ewan, they described um, uh, excessive growth of the lining of the gut, um, which is um, this kind of what's known as hyperplasia, excessive growth. Um, could be a first step towards cancer and also immune system disturbances. I can't remember the precise details, but minimally we have here gut lesions, immune system disturbances, and brain, um, brain development abnormalities. Well, uh, they, they, as I recall, they did, did, went to great lengths to discredit him and say that this research sure. is, oh, but did, didn't ultimately, wasn't it Lancet or somebody that stood up for him? Yes, that's and right. Yes. Was exonerated? Mm -hmm. Yes, the, that's the, right. the Lancet published his paper and uh, they took the unusual step of sending it out to more than the usual number of pe peer reviewers. So they sent it out to six peer reviewers Five of them recommended publication and one objected. 
um, and we know who, who that was. It was somebody who consistently promotes GM crops and claims that they're safe. So uh, yeah, this paper went through the mill before it was published. Um, it's a very small publication, but it had major effects. And it, it certainly played into the European Union's decision to insist on regulation for GM foods and crops, and also to insist on, on labeling. Well, he was a real hero and still having yes. effects today. Are those effects being eroded or tr somebody's trying to pull them back? Yeah, most certainly they are because at the moment there's a push in every country to what they call deregulate, which means remove regulations from um, gene GMO foods and crops. In particular, the new ones like um, gene edited foods and crops. This is a, a newer form of genetic modification. It is a genetic modification technique, uh, but all over the world, these people are saying, um, the, the GMO advocates are saying, oh, gene edited foods and crops are not real GMOs. They're not like old style GMOs and they should not be regulated and, and they certainly don't need a label. So there's an attempt to roll back the regulations that have been established for GMOs in order to smooth the path to market for these new style gene edited GMOs. And in particular in the UK, we're, we're fighting a huge battle at the moment because the UK government has made up its mind that it wants to liberate GMOs, as Boris Johnson puts it, from what he calls anti-GMO regulations for which you can read the EU's GMO regulations. He wants to scrap those and just allow these, these foods to be sold and the seeds to be sold just like any other normal seeds or foods. Um, so that would mean no safety checks, no labeling, and we're very concerned about it. There's a public consultation going on at the moment to which we're all submitting evidence. Um, but it looks as if the UK government has already made up its mm. mind. So yeah. really the consultation is, it just seems like a bit of a, a lip service really to public opinion. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a sad thing. The, again, they, uh, <clears throat> what we're seeing here is what we've seen before with the first generation transgenic GMO uh, crops and foods, which is that where claims of precision, predictability, and safety, and, um, and also claims that the end product could be some, in at least two major gene editing outcomes, two major gene editing applications. Advocates are claiming that these could arise naturally. In principle, they could arise naturally. And if that is the case, why should you be worried if what we do mimics what happens in nature. Again, completely ignoring the process by which you bring out the outcome. They're, they're, uh, what they're attempting is to detract them, completely ignoring. They're saying, forget the process, just focus on the end result. Now that couldn't be more unscientific even if you try, because the process is all important. How a, mu a mutation, how a gene variation arises in nature is completely different to how you, you could produce a very similar outcome through gene editing in the, robot the laboratory. Gene editing is an artificial laboratory-based genetic modification procedure, undeniably. Therefore, by definition, it gives rise to a GMO, even if the outcome may mimic in some way, some small way, what may happen in nature, but how you end up with the same end in nature and how you end up with the same end through gene editing, the laboratory procedure, are completely and utterly different. And why is that important? Because process informs you where things can go wrong, where the errors can come in. If you ignore the process and just look at the end result, you, you'll miss all the errors that have come along with your intended change. And that, that is why this lobby 
to try to redefine a GMO to exclude these gene edited products by ignoring the process by which they are produced is completely and utterly unscientific. It's akin to some of the, uh, an example that I use to just to show you uh, just how bad and ridiculous it is. It's like me, say I wanted to publish a study, you know, I've got these results from an ex a study and I submit my results without the met materials or methods to the journal for publication. So I say to the journal, don't worry about how I got these results, just look at my results uh, and, and decide whether you want to publish it or not. Of course, my paper will be thrown in the bin straight away. It's absolutely ridiculous to think of me, of me trying to publish a paper without telling everybody how the materials and methods, the method of how I got the results. It's ridiculous. And yet, that is exactly what these advocates of gene editing are attempting here. They're saying, forget the methods, just focus on the result. They are absolutely ridiculous. And I, I think a good example of why it's important not to ignore the process is the recent case of the gene edited hornless cattle. Um, this is a very famous case that made its way into the mainstream media um, because this company called Recombinetics gene edited cattle in order to make them hornless. Uh, they did not grow horns. And they were touting this as a completely natural thing, because obviously there are cattle that are naturally born without horns. Um, and also they were saying that the gene editing was totally precise and uh, we know exactly where the gene is going and there are no unintended effects whatsoever. And uh, that this, this gene edited hornless cattle is just like any naturally hornless cattle and therefore it shouldn't be regulated. They were very, very vocal about opposing any kind of regulation um, on gene edited animals. And uh, anyway, what happened was that a couple of FDA scientists were sitting at home without very much to do. <laughs> and they decided that they would analyze the genome of these cattle. Uh, this was led by a a scientist called Norris, at least her surname is Norris, I don't remember her Christian name. And uh, what she found when she analyzed this, the genomes of these cattle were that actually, unexpectedly, there were antibiotic resistance genes incorporated into these hornless cattle. Now, we don't know whether that would actually have any health implications for consumers of the cattle or the cattle themselves, we simply don't know because a detailed risk assessment has never been done. But basically, Recombinetics, the, the company that did this, they were saying, this is just like a naturally bred hornless cow. You don't need to do any regulation. You don't need to do any safety checks. They definitely don't need to be labeled. They were arguing all those things. And meanwhile, these hidden antibiotic resistance genes were present in the cattle. We don't know whether they, they might have affected the health of the cattle in terms of um, perhaps the genes could have jumped into pathogenic bacteria and all of a sudden you have a, a disease that is antibiotic resistant in the cattle or perhaps consumers of the meat products or the, the dairy products of these cattle you know, it may add to the problem of antibiotic resistance in human consumers. We simply don't know because it hasn't been looked at. But I think the point to come away from this um, is that developers, GMO developers, must not be allowed to be in a position to say, our product is completely natural, there's nothing wrong with it, just focus on the product and do not look at the process. Because it's looking at the process that enabled the FDA scientists to work out that actually we've got to look for these antibiotic resistance genes. You know, they might be in there. And lo and behold, they found that they were. Well, I have a question to ask about that is if they if they were actually looking for these antibiotic resistant genes and they had, in a sense, an agenda of what they were looking for, what is it that they weren't looking for that might be there? Yeah, yeah, true. This is true. Um, they, they could have missed other genetic damage. 
these antibiotics resistance genes were inadvertently inserted into the DNA of the cattle um, from the, 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 from the molecules that carried the gene editing tool into the, the cells that ultimately led to the gene edited cattle. But they, the, but uh, what the FDA scientists could have missed was other genetic damage that the process we know is highly prone to. It could not, having said that, in the case of animals, um, large, you know, serious major genetic damage elsewhere probably would have resulted in a non-viable um, embryo and, and therefore birth. You know, because we know from animals as well as humans, we know that deep damage to DNA can result in um, a pregnancy not going forward because there's a developmental block, or you end up with with a, a, a birth that is deep, a, a birth defect. These are normally quite easy to sort of pick up in the case of animals, but in the case of crops, because similar things can happen, similar unintended genetic mutations happen from gene editing. In the case of crops, now crops, plants are far more tolerant to genetic alterations. And um, certainly from what I've seen and what we've seen is that developers of gene editing crops have not very, 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 I'm not aware of one instance where the analysis was done deep enough, thoroughly enough to pick up on larger scale DNA damage than what is normally claimed to take place. So normally with gene editing, you, you know, uh, in, in these two major applications, you either destroying a gene function through just changing a small bit of DNA sequence or by either removing or inserting a small amount of DNA sequence. But we, now, but we know that gene editing can actually result in much larger losses of DNA, deletions, much larger deletions of DNA, or much larger insertions of, of new DNA at, in a given location, or even what we call rearrangements of the DNA. So a bit of DNA that's over there now finds itself in a completely different region. Of, of the chromosome. These large scale uh, genetic alterations can alter the function of multiple genes. So, they, so the plant gene editor goes in to try and change the function of one gene, but at the end of the day, because of these unintended larger scale mutations that are inherent to the procedure uh, can take place that affect the functioning of multiple genes. And therefore, increase the possibility of, of, of adversely affecting the biochemistry of, of the crop and the food much, much uh, more likely. So um, these are the sorts of things that can happen, which is why from the process and that if the advocates get their way where they say, you don't have to worry about the process, it means there'll be no obligation on the part of developers of these crops and animals to really analyze the outcome of their manipulation in a completely comprehensive manner to make to 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 identify whether only their intended chain change has happened and nothing else has been altered. Yeah, this is a complete lack uh, in the system uh, at the moment. And, and I should add also that as a result of this this gene edited hornless cattle fiasco. There was some political fallout, which does affect um, your audience over there in America, potentially, because what happened was that the FDA scientists were so alarmed by this that they, they've been very, very vocal, um, not particularly the scientists that wrote that paper, but other scientists within the FDA have come out and said, this kind of thing shows why we need to keep strict regulation of gene edited animals. They haven't actually spoken about crops, but they're saying gene edited animals must be very tightly regulated in a way that we look at the processes that, that created these animals, mm -hmm. because that will inform us as to what to look for. Now, I was very impressed by that. I thought this, this is a really brave stance by the FDA. 
And it was at a time when Trump was just trying to liberate biotechnology from any minor rules that you have over there. Um, he was even trying to remove those. And I thought that was extremely brave. But now I notice another development, which is the, the USDA, the Department of Agriculture in the US, uh, which is extremely friendly towards all kinds of GMOs, has now come out and said, um, we want to take away the regulation of gene edited animals from the FDA and control it ourselves. Now we know what this is about, this is about basically removing the safeguards that the FDA scientists think are necessary. And uh, the USDA has a very, very weak regulatory approach yeah, to GMOs. Very true. Well, and it's virtually non-existent. Virtually non-existent. <laughs> and they will just wave things through. So we think that this is a very dodgy um, development. And in fact, there is a public consultation going on. Um, I'm not sure whether it's finished. It, it may be, it may not be. But uh, there, there has been a, a consultation going on, inviting people to give their views on whether they think it's a good idea for the USDA to take over regulation. And we advise people to say, no, it is not a good idea. It seems to be a very strong push, because as I recall, the, your, the UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson, I think one of his first speeches was, we're going to yeah. push GMO. And I also... Yeah interviewed somebody who was in the room of a Hungarian minister when Hillary Clinton with the American ambassador in tow barge in say we're going to talk about GMO the minister says mm, you do what you want but not here and then they barged out <laughs> but in the past haven't the FDA scientists like when they were first starting GMO according to Stephen Drucker this FDA scientist said, wait a minute, wait a minute, uh, something, we need to look at this more, but then the FDA pushed through and put GMOs upon it. Yeah, the, the political aspects of the FDA, I'm afraid, triumphed over the scientists. In the very early days of GM crops, the FDA scientists did excellent analyses and wrote them up in memos and said, um, these are the dangers. Basically what Michael was talking about, new toxins or allergens and also heightened levels of existing toxins and allergens may result in these GM crops. Um, they wrote very, very good analyses um, of that type. And then they were basically overruled um, by the political head of the FDA who decided that the FDA's policy was to foster the growth of biotechnology. And uh, basically they, they just shut down the scientists and um, they've operated ever since as a very loose um, GMO friendly organization. Um, I think that, that there have always been honest scientists in the FDA and clearly there are some looking at these, these gene edited animals, but I'm afraid the political side of the FDA has so far um, triumphed quite often over the, the, the scientific concerns. Hmm. And uh, that, is, that is a terrible shame. But I think you know, the, the, the good things that the FDA does, and they do do good things from time to time, we need to encourage them and, and you know, thank them for doing that. I'd like to point out to the audience, it's the same FDA that I think with the assistance of Donald Rumsfeld, pushed through aspartame, which was a known neurotoxin. And they were also knew that it was carcinogenic. And I think the rumor is they're about to bring suit against the company because they have falsified research. So they pushed this upon us. And that, you know, last year when I looked at my hospitals, uh, what they had to drink, everything had aspartame in it. And you had a lot in the UK as well. So oh, yes, that's our FDA. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that was a brain cancer study that was done in animals where the original data was sequestered by the FDA, supposedly locked down um, legally, and the data disappeared. So the FDA was in charge of the data and the data disappeared. And it was 12 cases of brain cancer in the aspartame animals and zero cases of brain cancer in the control animals. And then miraculously, the data was found um, and nobody, you know, nobody looked at the custody issue from a criminal perspective, but suddenly one of the 
cancers was in the control group. So it was 11 to one instead of 12 to zero. And uh -huh. that allowed the excuse to be made that that was random and not statistically significant. Uh, <laughs> yes. yes. Also, um, uh, according to Schuler, who was, uh, I think, at Columbia or someplace, the universities seem to have a tilt that's very pro-GMO and resistant yes. to questioning. Yes, I'm afraid the industry, industry funding is now all pervasive within uh, academia. That's not all a bad thing, uh, of course. Um, but what it can result in is, of course, uh, industry, uh, it's not, uh, the universities are, are clearly very grateful for these large sums of industry money that are coming into their institutions and they're afraid of losing it. So I'm afraid there is a tendency or it can be a tendency for uh, results that are damning on uh, industry products not to be presented fully truthfully uh, or not or not at all. Uh, in order to um, not cast a dark shadow over those products that may compromise either existing or potential market market value. Yeah. Um, this this is uh, happened has happened in the case of, of GM foods, uh, GM crop developments at universities in the United States and in institutions here uh, within the, the UK as well. It's uh, uh, Say it's um, so yeah, it, it, it is a very worrying situation that uh, that's coming in principle. You know, industry academia collaboration looks very, very good, but we need to make sure we don't put money, financial interests ahead of life, ahead of public safety and environmental yeah. safety. And in, in, in some cases, industry is funding whole departments of universities and huge chunks of research coming from companies like Monsanto, Bayer, and Bazef, and Dow. Um, this is now common, very, very common. Mm. And uh, what you do find is that universities, even when they're offered money, I know somebody in America has actually raised money because he was concerned about the possible effects of GM feed on livestock. And he raised his own money to sponsor uh, a research study at the university local to him. And he went along to the university with, you know, pockets full of dollars and said, I have all this money. Could you please do a study for me? And none of them would touch it. He said that they were just too scared. They told him, go away. <laughs> yeah, sad. And I speak as somebody who has been working with industry, by the way, for many years. I, I'm working with a major US company as we speak. And when, and with mutual respect and, and, uh, the, uh, and with the objective of producing something of, of, of clinical value, things can go very well because there are the safety checks there uh, as well. And, uh, but in the case of GM, GM crop developments that the this this isn't there you know the safety checks aren't there and there is such a, a huge commercial vested interest that's driving the whole development that it, it literally that comes before uh, anything else and this is a sad sad one of the sad things that's come from the industry academia uh, links. I've got a question for you about the safety um, aspect of it. Um, has anybody looked at the um, uh, antibody subclasses of um, not only the IgE, but the IgG, IgM, and IgA antibody changes in animals that have been exposed to um, GM uh, foods as opposed to non-GM foods to see if there is a, um, a, a differential in the allergic reaction? Yeah, good question. I can't answer it. <laughs> I'm, 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 I have a very uh, a good feeling that, that something like that has been done and I know which papers to go to to, to check on that. Um, but I, um, it's a very good question and, and worth looking into to see whether, because there have been some studies with BTGM corn. Mm -hmm. And in those, uh, 
effects on the immune system have been found, uh, but at the uh, a cellular level and, and also uh, a regulatory cytokine uh, factor, uh, regulatory level. But I can't remember if antibody types were also looked at to see what uh, immune response predominated or not, because you're right, uh, if it's of the one type, it would be indicative of a, of a, of a potential allerg allergic reaction. A differential allergic a reaction. reaction. That's right, differential allergic reaction. Yeah. That's right. Um, uh, I, but I, I, as I say, off the top of my head, I'm afraid I can't remember whether that was looked into in those particular uh, uh, animal studies with either the Roundup tolerant or the BT, especially the BT. The worry there is more, I think, with the BT GM corn varieties, because we know that the BT itself is highly immunogenic. So, um, I would it, that would it would be in those studies where the type of uh, differential antibody responses uh, could have been uh, observed. I got a question for you about your core technology of genetic expression. Yes. Um, I know that, for example, there's a, a three nucleotide frame um, issue that's involved yes. in transcribing. Um, DNA into messenger RNA and then into protein, but are there larger scale frame reading systems involved in DNA that involve things possibly like, for example, what is the, the, the genetic distance for one wrap around a histone molecule or something like that, where the larger scale issues might affect, uh, let's say crossover events or, um, genetic manipulation differentially? Yeah. Um, these, uh, the, the genetic code is when we have a triplet code, three, ba three DNA base units encode for a particular amino acid at a particular position in a protein. That is invariant. The other uh, things you were mentioning um, uh, Stephen, have to do with regulation of, uh, of the expression of the gene um, in terms of its, uh, and there are various levels at, uh, of, at where the, uh, ex the regulation of gene expression take place. By regulation of gene expression, what I mean by that is, first of all, whether a gene, whether a gene is switched on or off, when the gene is switched on, it means the genetic in the information that's contained within it is being copied into RNA, and then that's going on to, to be translated into protein. If a gene is switched off, there is no mRNA production, and that gene is silenced. So you don't end up with a protein product. But these are the two extremes. In between there, there are various levels that a gene can be switched on, a little bit or a lot. So either you're producing a small amount of protein or a large amount of protein. And the degree, uh, the level of expression, it, it, this is what is defined as the level of expression of a gene, how much product it's actually producing, which could be zero or something. Uh, <clears throat> now, there are various layers of control that determine the degree of expression of a gene. <clears throat> they are of two types, what we call genetic and epigenetic. By genetic, we mean that there are sequences within and around the gene, the gene being defined here as a region of DNA that carries information for a particular protein. That's, let's take that as a definition right now. So there are regions within, either within the gene itself or nearby or around it, at close or further away, DNA sequences that control its expression. These are called genetic regulatory elements. And technically they're called promoters, enhancers, lockers, control regions, etc. Just put those in for those who are, are interested. In addition to these, this genetic control, we have also what's known as epigenetic control, which is epigenetics literally means on genetics or above genetics. Epi means above. 
So epigenetics means above genetics. These are layers of molecular structures that sit on the, literally, virtually, you could say, sit on the DNA that then control the function of the underlying genes. In other words, whether they're switched on, and if they are switched on, to what level they are switched on. And one of the things you mentioned about the DNA being wrapped around other proteins known as nucleosomes, uh, this forms a structure known as chromatin. And this chromatin structure is one of the epigenetic regulatory processes that exists within our, within our, with our DNA in our cells that controls the expression of the gene because the, the folding of the DNA with these other proteins can either be open and permissive to the gene being expressed, or it can be highly compacted and non-permissive. Um, so, um, so that that's uh, how you know briefly the layers of gene regulation. But in terms of the genetic code itself, that is this epigenetic and genetic control doesn't affect that. It's uh, that's an, an invariant. Uh, the genetic code is, is invariant. So, to what extent does do the various techniques of genetic modification yes. destabilize those layers of regulation? Yeah, I mean, and they can do. They can do that. Um, the uh, there can be changes in the in the structure of the chromatin disruption of genetic control elements uh, so that the level of expression of a given gene can be uh, put out of balance. It can be too high or too low, normally lower. So, and even the gene editing tools have recently, a paper was published that described yet another unexpected outcome from the CRISPR gene editing uh, procedure, which is that it can cause epigenetic changes, changes in the DNA methylation. One of, another epigenetic layer of control that I forgot to mention is actual modification of the DNA itself, which is called methylation, uh, which is on the C base unit residues of the DNA. If you have a lot of it around, taking in particular crucial regions, a gene will be switched off. If you remove them, the gene will be switched on. And inappropriate switching on of a gene or switching off of a gene can have dire consequences. In an animal or human context, it could be one step towards a cancer. But what's been found, what was found in this study quite unexpectedly, that just the procedure using the CRISPR gene editing tool brings about unexpected changes in DNA methylation patterns and therefore changes in gene expression. I mean, you again, if you if you look at the, how this gene editing tool works, you would never have predicted that that would, would actually happen. But yet, here it is. So yes, there's another consideration now. Not only can the CRISPR gene editing tool cause mutations on a big scale, not only where you don't, you know, in you, where off target, where you don't intend it, but even at the location where you're trying to do this so-called precise alteration, you can have mutations on a big scale that you don't want. So not only does CRISPR, CRISPR gene editing bring about unexpected genetic changes, but even now it's bringing about unexpected epigenetic changes as well, which will carry forward because epigenetic changes, just like genetic changes, can be inherited down the line, you know, down being transmitted from parent to offspring down the line. And there will be consequences because they're altering patterns of gene function. And if you alter patterns of gene function, you alter biochemistry, and that there will be knock-on effects from that. Do we know enough that a enlightened um, genetic modification modifier could anticipate all those reactions to prevent them? That's just a wonderful question. I would say absolutely not. Why do that? <laughs> Why do I say that? I say that because, uh, as I mentioned uh, at, at the beginning, genes work as a network. Every, every gene of an organism works to produce the complex characteristics 
that constitute the organism as a whole. Um, whether it's a plant, an animal, or a human. And that network of function is so complex, in my view, that we don't have the tools or the computing power to know it all. Because what you're asking for, Stephen, is first of all, we need to know it all. We need to know everything. We need to know every gene, where it's expressed, how it's expressed, how it works with this, with every other gene before we can then have been a position to say, oh, if I change this gene this way, I can predict what the effect that's gonna have on the network. We are nowhere near being able to have that totality of knowledge that would allow you to make that prediction. So no, and, and so it's those who think that their gene editing, I can pre completely predict and everything, they are living in a world of fantasy. Not, and for me, it's shameful because they're actually ignoring what modern genetics is telling them. What modern genetics is, tells them is that genes work as a whole. They are, gene function is what we call omnigenic in nature, omni being totality. Omnigenics was a term coined by a Stanford professor when he discovered that complex characteristics that constitute an organism, it could be for example, in us as humans, our height or our or a complex disease such as a, a mental health problem. What he found for these complex traits, as they're called, is that the functioning of every single gene is at the basis of these complex traits. Every single gene, not just one, but every single one of the 20,000 genes that we have is involved in bringing about that complex trait. And so he coined the term omnigenics to describe this phenomenon of total involvement of genes as functioning as a network to bring about a complex trait. So this is why, and the plant gene editors particularly, are completely ignoring the implications of this basic science. They think they can just tweak a gene and predict everything that happens. This, I'm afraid, is not a, it's fantasy based on on the science and, and their ideas that they can tweak one or two genes and suddenly massively increase yield or make a crop drought tolerant or disease resistant or, or pest resistant, whatever, is again fantasy because these are complex traits. Complex traits means the totality of the plant's genome is involved in bringing about these complex characteristics. So you've got saying, oh, I'll tweak this gene and my yield is gonna double. You know, you, it is a fantasy. It really is fantasy. And you're wasting, you might as well, don't even begin. You're wasting your time and your money by trying to even attempt this kind of thing. What this tells you is, if I, I'll just finish before handing over to Claire, because I know she wants to say something. What that tells us is that if we want to work with complex traits, we have to work with the totality of the genome, keep it as an integrated whole. How do we do that? Through natural breeding. This is, when we do natural breeding, when we cross this variety of corn with another variety of corn or wheat or whatever like that, we are working, keeping the genome's integrity as a whole. We're bringing new combinations, but keeping that integrity that complex integrity of the genome together. And as a result, we stand a very good chance of imparting a new complex trait in our new crop variety. Something that gene editing and transgenic GM can only dream about. And I think uh, given what you've just said about how little we know about the way that genes function, how little we understand about that. It seems to be an absolute travesty to choose now to be the time to remove regulations yes. <laughs> from gene edited crops. You know, just about every month, some group of scientists comes out with a new discovery about the effects of CRISPR. Oh, we didn't expect this, but my goodness, it does this. And it does that, and all these are unintended effects. They were not what they were trying to get. So given that degree of error, 
the fact that this powerful lobby is demanding that these foods and crops be deregulated, safety checks removed, labeling removed, to me, it is the height of hubris and sheer irresponsibility. It's totally astonishing to me that, that this should even have come up as a possibility. And um, also, I just wanted to add to what Michael was saying about conventional breeding. Um, we actually have a section on our website, gmwatch.org, on non-GM successes. And it's basically all these uh, conventionally bred crops, which have these wonderful traits that we're told by the GMO lobby that can only be conferred through GM, you know, drought tolerance, pest resistance, disease resistance, etc. All these wonderful traits, they're already there in very many crops. And um, they, they just need to be rolled out more widely. And also, um, I think if scientists could work in combination with farmers, because farmers from every region of the world knows, they know which crops work well in which situations. They know which are the drought tolerant seeds, which are the uh, flood tolerant seeds, etc. So it's that kind of knowledge that should be foregrounded. And um, we shouldn't forget also that genetics is only part mm -hmm. of farming success. The, the larger part of it, perhaps, is actually the farming systems that we use. And we have to get back to things like agroecology. Because th this is really the key um, of, of giving people food sovereignty and sure. um, healthy food, food security, um, good farmer incomes. There's enough studies now to show us that these kinds of methods can provide very good incomes for farmers in the third world, often much better than growing so-called cash crops for export. Um, and they also feed the communities. So this is the kind of thing we need to focus on, soil building, crop rotations, companion planting, all these things that we know how to do, and they should just be encouraged and rolled out more widely. It is a total travesty that we're, we're sinking millions of dollars into these dead end you know, jam tomorrow solutions. Oh, we know it hasn't worked so far, but maybe the next one might work, you know? <laughs> and um, a case in point with this is, is Mr. Gates, you know, Bill Gates has vast amounts of money and he pours it into GMO projects, um, often for the third world, the developing nations. And I'm afraid these so-called solutions do not work. There's been one failure after another. Mm -hmm. And um, I hear from people, for example, working in Africa on cassava breeding. Cassava is this starchy crop that is eaten a lot in various countries in Africa. And they do have problems with cassava viruses that are destroying some parts of their crop. And it's been well known for many years that the way to deal with these viruses is actually to supply farmers with virus-free cassava tubers that they can plant. And, you know, it's relatively easy to ensure that, that this, sub, this stuff is virus free. And um, these programs are successful, but they are starved of funding. And the projects that Bill Gates is funding hugely are the GMO projects. And guess what? One has just failed yet again. So. <laughs> So to my mind, the money is going into the wrong things. It's, it's this obsession with genes, and it's also an obsession with patents. Mm -hmm. We know that Bill Gates is not um, Mr. Open Source. He's Mr. Closed Source. He uh, makes software that is closed source. You have to pay for it. Um, in the case of Microsoft Word, for example, I now have to pay Bill Gates every year if I want to use Microsoft Word. So. Um, he is really into the idea of, of GM, but I'm afraid it, it's a delusion. Um, I think he's into it partly because GM seeds can be patented, and that is really the driving force behind the push for GM. It is patents. I have a question here from one of the 
uh, listeners who was talking about detoxing GMOs in one system and the question of, is there anything um, above and beyond avoiding exposure to GM foods that you can talk about? Sure. Yes, um, we've, we have some friends in America who are doctors and um, we've talked to them at great length about the best methods of helping people who believe that their health has been affected by eating GMOs and pesticides. And um, they pretty much have the regime um, down. They've, they've worked it out over many years. And this is what they recommend. They recommend, first of all, that you go on a GMO-free, organic, whole food diet, uh, heavily oriented towards plants. Um, it's not to say you have to be vegetarian. The doctors that recommend these, these diets are mostly not vegetarian, but they're saying focus on plants mostly, make sure they are non-GMO, make sure they are grown organically. So when you go shopping, you're looking not only for organic, but you're also looking for non-GMO. Um, and there's a, a specific kind of butterfly um, label of the non-GMO project. Um, and you find that on a lot of uh, a lot of foods in America. I was amazed that even in the airport, you know, they're selling non uh, non GMO project verified um, foods. So basically minimally processed uh, cook from scratch. Um, they also use these doctors also use various other methods um, which they recommend for their patients, things like herbal. Um, medicines, food supplements. Some of them use um, a system called homeopathy. So all these things together, these physicians mostly call themselves integrative physicians, which seems to be a, a term in America. We don't have it so much here. Um, but these are the people who can advise you and help you recover from such a diet. Now, the doctors who prescribe these diets to their patients tell us that um, they get really remarkable results, like sometimes between 80 and 100% improvement in the, the health condition in just a couple of weeks, between two and six weeks of being on the new diet. I can't pretend it's easy and I can't pretend it's cheap. Um, in some regions of America, you have to pay good money to buy um, organic foods. Um, Clearly, for those people who are in a position to grow their own organic food, that's good. Um, but for the people who find it a bit of a struggle, um, you know, these doctors say that, that they can give advice, but ultimately it's about prioritizing a healthy diet for you and your family. And if that means making sacrifices elsewhere, that's, that's what they tend to advise. At the end of the day, uh, ill health is very expensive. Yeah. So um, it's money well invested if you prioritize uh, your your health and then the rest follows. Oh, and I, I should recommend a book as well that was written by um, one of these doctors. Her name is Michelle Perot. She's a pediatrician based in California, and she's written a book uh, called What's Making Our Children Sick, and it's available on Amazon. She's been on our presentations and you can look on our website to see what Excellent. she has to say. Great. And I could add, because the topic of the micro, gut microbiome was raised there. I think it was Stephen that mentioned it. Um, the reason for the plant-rich whole food organic diet is a first step to uh, ensuring that we have a balanced, diverse gut microbiome which is, we know now is all important for our health because the, the, uh, the gut bacteria and fungi to some degree as well that I inhabit our gut, but mostly bacteria, they are producing substances that pass into the body. And these molecules act as signaling molecules uh, that help with the balanced functioning of our internal organs. To give you an example, since the immune system was mentioned uh, in our discussion so far, our gut microbiome produces molecules that are immune system modulators, particularly these are 
what are known as short chain fatty acids. So these short chain fatty acids help produce bile gut bacteria into the body and they help with the balanced functioning of our immune system. And in the absence of a balanced microbiome and inadequate uh, production and balance of a short chain fatty acid, that's gonna be one factor to producing a compromised immune system that would leave you open to uh, diseases, infectious diseases that otherwise you would deal with without any trouble. Another example is serotonin. Uh, serotonin, the so-called feel-good hormone. 90% of our serotonin is actually produced by special cells that line our gut, the enterochromatin cells. 90% of it, only 10% is produced in your brain and maybe elsewhere. But the production of serotonin from those special subclass of gut cells is controlled by signals from the gut bacteria. So if, you're, if those bacteria that are producing those signals are, are not there working in a balanced, balanced way, then the signals don't go to the gut cells and your serotonin production release is compromised. And this is the sort of thing that could be a contributing factor to mental health problems such as depression. So very, very important to have the gut microbiome balanced, fed well, maintained well, and making sure we don't, again, ingest things that can cause imbalance. One of the things that can cause imbalance, of course, are highly processed foods, high sugar, high fructose, but also pesticides. We're increasingly getting evidence that pesticide residues can disturb the gut microbiome. My group published a paper last week which showed how glyphosate and Roundup can cause disturbances in the function of the gut microbiome. You can go to the, if you want to have a very, very good brief of our article findings, go to the GM Watch website, uh, which is run by Claire. But also go to, the, we published a paper in the top toxicology journal called Environmental Health Perspectives. And the paper is free to download, it's open source, I'm glad to say. But in that paper, we show how there are alterations in the population of the gut bacteria in the animals that were fed the glyphosate, but particularly in the animals fed the Roundup. But more important than the changes in the population was the changes in its biochemistry. Because you can, you can have very modest changes in the population of bacteria, but you can have dramatic changes in the function of the bacteria, the biochemistry of the bacteria. And we found some very dramatic changes in the, uh, in the gut bacterial biochemistry, in the gut biochemistry. We found first and foremost that glyphosate inhibits the same biochemistry in the gut bacteria as it does in plants in its process of killing, killing the weeds that the farmer is trying to kill. But also we found very dramatic changes in the biochemistry that indicated that the glyphosate and especially the Roundup were subjecting the gut microbiome to oxidative stress. And we also found major markers of oxidative stress in the blood biochemistry of the very same animals. And these were at levels of glyphosate and Roundup exposure that regulators tell us are safe. You know, that we shouldn't really, we should, in other words, we shouldn't have seen anything in these rats at the doses that we administered the glyphosate and the Roundup to. But the reality was that we saw some very major worrying changes in the biochemistry of both the gut and the blood, especially suggestive of what we call oxidative stress. Oxidative stress is not a good thing. Oxidative stress, which is what we call reactive oxygen that hasn't been neutralized. We produce it around our bodies and we have mechanisms of neutralizing it. But if through uh, various stressors on our body, we produce excessive oxidative stress, uh, it overwhelms the 
uh, the neutralizing capability of our bodies. And that, ox that this reactive oxygen oxidative stress can damage not only our structures of our organs and our cells, but also our DNA. Oxidative stress is a known DNA damaging agent. And DNA damage is not a good thing because we know that DNA damage is a major risk factor for many diseases, but especially cancer. So this is what our, our, our one of our, our, our most recent study on glyphosate and Roundup. We published other work, we can look it up, but it, it shows you, gives us even more reason to avoid these, these pesticides in our diet. We should avoid using them at home on our gardens. We should campaign to stop pesticide use in our, in our parks. But above all, we need to stop using these poisons on our foods. I mean, it's a crazy situation. We, at the moment, most of our food is grown with intentionally with the crops being sprayed with known poisons. And it, it, it's bizarre, but that's the reality. And we, and, regard, and we know that the, regulation, the regulatory system that has approved uh, these, this pesticide use has major flaws. Major now, I would flaws like to... I would like to add that oxidative stress and inflammation all mm -hmm. intimately connected with uh, insulin resistance are one of the major, that, that's, that's just the perfect setup for going on the pathway toward any chronic disease. Yes, I would indeed. also like to add, according to E.G. Valionados, who worked for the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency for 25 years, the studies did not exist. The lab was fake. They did two months of studies and made up the rest. The EPA knew about it and it just didn't, uh, I mean, it was a, yeah, it was a exactly. disaster. I mean, and also, uh, according to Monsanto papers, apparently that came up with research that the, Monsanto knew that glyphosate caused cancer and a couple yeah. in Livermore got a $2 billion judgment and they and Monsanto has this approach, let nothing go. If anything annoys them just a little bit, they'll go after it. So what he's saying about oxidative stress and glyphosate, we haven't even gotten to yet. That's a huge problem. So tell us more. Um, well, that, that's what our latest paper. We've got more studies that are following up on the one that I just mentioned, uh, Susan. So as I say, watch this space. You, you we'll be announcing these uh, follow-up studies uh, very soon, uh, because obviously one of the predictors, of, one of the predictions of oxidative stress is DNA damage. So we're now doing follow-up work. We're in the middle of follow-up work uh, where we're looking to see whether the oxidative stress from glyphosate roundup exposure is causing DNA damage. Um, we're also, also not forgetting, we're also not forgetting the fact that of course, we're exposed to complex mixtures of pesticides every day. It's not just glyphosate uh, and, and roundup, it's we're exposed to a whole spectrum of fungicides and insecticides and other herbicides uh, as well. And these are there readily detectable in the food that we eat every day if it's not organic. And by, in, you know, okay, organic food can be inadvertently contaminated by the non-organic in, in, in the fields, but at least in the organic, the levels of contaminants is, is a fraction of what you find in, in, chem, in food produced through conventional chemical-based agriculture. And again, what we're finding in one of our, in, in a study, we have a preprint of it, um, on the bioarchive that you can look up, just search for my name on bioarchive and you'll find it. Where we fed the rats a mixture of the six top pesticides that are found in foodstuffs, which were glyphosate, or it always comes up, glyphosate is always there. And then we've got three fungicides and two insecticides. And, what, and again, we gave the, the rats again a dose, a very low dose. Again, the dose that the European Union regulator says we can we can ingest day in day out and have no health problems whatsoever but sure enough i'd say sure enough but what we found using proper in-depth molecular compositional analysis what's known as omics analysis again we found major disturbances in the gut biochemistry the blood biochemistry the organ and the anatomy of the organs that was damaged to the liver the kidneys uh 
even from resulting from this mixture at this very low dose of each one of these pesticides, which as I, as I emphasize is um, regulators say we should have seen no negative effect, no ill effect whatsoever. So we, these, um, again, all of the work that's coming out of my lab going back several years now, starting with our, um, our, um, our two papers, you know, we published in 2015 and 2016, which again shows that what we call an ultra low dose of Roundup. These rats were given such an incredibly low dose of Roundup that it's actually more than 400,000 times lower than what the US regulator says permits. I mean, that's how ridiculous the thing is. You know, we get these rats ingested such an incredibly low dose of Roundup, and yet we found ev evidence of uh, severe kidney damage, non alcoholic fatty liver disease over a two year period. Of, of ingestion, ingestion. So all of these results for me, you know, I have to believe my own results, which tell me I've got to avoid these things. You know, if I'm, if I want to be good to myself, I've got to avoid these kind, the, the, not just glyphosate, but pesticides in general. Hence our recommendation, Claire mentioned that eat as much organic whole food as you possibly can, as you can afford, and that will be. Uh, lays your foundation uh, for, for good uh, for good health. Tell us about the time you went to the U.S. and you eat, and I'm sure you eat very carefully, plant laden, and you came back and you were shocked by your glyphosate levels. Oh right, <laughs> yeah, that was quite amusing on one level. Um, I was uh, at a conference in San Diego where I was not able to eat organic. <laughs> Uh, at the conference, uh, I was just eating whatever was on offer uh, in the local restaurant, um, and then uh, and then I went up to see my colleagues at UCSF uh, in San Francisco, and one of my colleagues there has developed a very good uh, analysis of glyphosate in human urine. So just out of fun and, in, and curiosity, myself and a friend of mine there uh, gave urine samples <laughs> to. Uh, um, to my colleague at UCSF to analyze the glyphosate. And the results came back that were quite shocking. In the one week that I had spent in California, my urine glyphosate levels was right in the range of what you typically find in Americans, wherever they are in the country. So, that, so I've become Americanized glyphosate-wise within the space of just one week. Uh, we, we know that for Europeans, the levels are normally levels are much, much, lower. much lower. And I would have been on organic in England anyway, mostly. So I know that my starting level before I went over would have been much, much lower. Do you have any recommendations for how people can cope with when they're living in countries or regions where GMO and um, organic labeling is not allowed? Well, um, in America, certainly uh, foods are labeled organic and they're also labeled non-GMO project approved. So you look for both of those labels. In other countries, it depends on what, what kind of um, legislation and regulations you have. Um, certainly in, in most of Europe, you will not be eating um, GMOs because the food retailers made the decision back in the 1990s that they didn't want to include GMOs in human food because Europeans simply wouldn't buy it because it has to be labeled GMO in, uh, in Europe. In other countries, I'm not so familiar. Um, I know that places like uh, Argentina and Brazil, I think they, I believe they do label GMOs. Mm -hmm. Um, they possibly do not label gene edited foods, but these are quite new, mm. so there shouldn't be very many out there mm. at the moment. Um, but other countries, do you know anything well, about Well, I think most, most countries that have any law in place about GMOs uh, do require labeling, whether it's you know, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, even in China, um, I say even, uh, <laughs> um, they, they do label. GM soy products, for example, 
Um, so, and included you know, in India as well. So I think there are labeling laws. It's a question of just how well the products are policed and therefore how honestly uh, the labeling is really, whether it's accurate or, or not. But I think um, organic fruit from trustworthy suppliers is the, is the safest bet uh, because by definition, no organic can be GMO. Um, some of the health effects of glyphosate, I understand it can open up the blood brain barrier. So all sorts of nasty things get in. It opens up the gut barrier. It interferes with the shikimate pathway. So we can't make the tertiary amines such as tryptophan and serotonin. And I also understand that it interferes with the liver's process of detoxification. So let me know if, I'm, uh, yeah, if that's correct. And please tell us the health effects. Yeah, there's, there's also some more um, research dating back very, very many years on effects of glyphosate and glyphosate based herbicides. And one of those effects, which perhaps has gone a little bit underground due to the um, huge focus on cancer, um, because in 2000 and when was it that the IARC came out with its verdict? 2015. Mm. Um, the International Agency for Research on Cancer came out with the um, judgment that glyphosate was a probable human carcinogen. And that, of course, launched all the lawsuits in America um, by people who were suffering non Hodgkin's lymphoma form of cancer. And they believed that they had got this from Roundup. Um, glyphosate herbicide exposure and all the cases that have made it to court so far um, the judgment has gone in favor of the plaintiffs who, who are complaining that Roundup caused their cancer um, and as a result via Monsanto the maker of uh, many glyphosate herbicides has had to pay huge amounts of damages to these people. Now something that's been um, slightly overlooked in uh, this major focus on cancer is that glyphosate based herbicides are also connected with other health effects. And one of those in particular is birth defects. Um, it's pretty much, uh, I would say the, the, the evidence is strong that glyphosate based herbicide exposure leads to birth defects. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Now, this has been shown in the yeah, yeah. neurological defects. The birth defects have shown up in animal studies um, dating back as far as the 1980s, I believe, possibly even earlier. Um, it's been seen in rats and in certain types of fish and other animals, frogs, etc. And uh, certainly in Argentina, mm -hmm. Um, I got to know a scientist over there who's now sadly died. Um, his name is Professor Andres Carrasco. And he did some early research in, I think, 2010. He was connecting the extraordinarily high level of birth defects that he saw in the population of Argentina um, in the rural areas. He was connecting that with the um, GM soy that is grown in those regions. And of course the GM soy is engineered to tolerate glyphosate spraying. And the glyphosate sprayers um, used to come over, it's done aery aerially from planes. So they used to come over and spray whole vast areas with massive amounts of glyphosate herbicide. And instantly what, what the uh, doctors over there saw immediately was um, a huge rise in birth defects, miscarriages as well, uh, stillbirths. Neurological defects. And, and neurological defects, yeah. And children being born with really severe developmental defects. Mm -hmm. So um, there's now been many, many uh, journalistic reports, um, photo essays, etc. The world eventually caught on to this problem and went out and did a whole load of um, reporting on it. And I actually think that this is a major, major scandal mm. because probably the US, certainly the EU, 
imports vast amounts of GM soy from Argentina and Brazil to feed animals mm -hmm. and also to feed cars. It goes into ethanol for um, you put in, in your car and it's a fuel. So we are actually importing this substance, this GM soy feed to feed our livestock in intensive farming mm -hmm. conditions which in itself is a problem for me. I don't like intensive farming of animals. But also we're importing this product which <clears throat> causes huge suffering in the place where it is grown. And I actually view it as almost on a par with slavery. Um, you know, there, were, there was a time here in England, we, we never had slavery actually on our shores. It didn't exist within England. But we were importing tobacco and sugar and cotton that was produced using slave labor. And I look upon this as a kind of crime against humanity that is almost in that league. And uh, I know that finally the European politicians have caught on to this, this problem and they're actually saying we should not be importing um, GM soy from these countries they're actually focusing more on the burning of the Amazon because that's also happening in order to clear land to grow this stuff. So they're not really focusing on the birth defects, but I think they should be. You're very good. I just want to correct one thing of that list of ailments um, that stemming from glyphosate, Roundup based herbicides, Susan. Uh, you are quite correct in saying that the primary mechanism of action for glyphosate uh, as a weed killer is inhibition of this biochemical pathway called the shikimate pathway. And this is responsible for producing some essential uh, aromatic amino acids like tryptophan, phenylalanine, and tyrosine. And when you block the synthesis of these essential amino acids, the the plant dies. That's the way, that's why glyphosate will kill everything except what's in, uh, that's either grown resistant or, of course, that's been en genetically engineered with a new gene uh, to, to tolerate the, the glyphosate and, and still grow. And it was hypothesized, um, and actually, this mechanism of how glyphosate works as a weed killer was. Uh, was touted to be one of the reasons why it was so safe to animals and humans, because we, as animals animals and as humans, we don't have this shikimate pathway. So if we don't have a shikimate pathway for the glyphosate to inhibit, then where's the, you know, where are the safety concerns? But what they forgot, of course, uh, the fact that some species of bacteria and fungi in our gut do have the shikimate pathway. So it was hypothesized some years ago, and this is one of the reasons why we did this study. It was hypothesized that if you ingested enough glyphosate, Roundup, it could inhibit the shikimate pathway of our gut bacteria and impede their growth and will end up with an imbalance in the populations of our gut bacteria. Uh, the studies prior to the one we published last week, but they were mixed. There were mixed uh, results. Some studies showed that glyphosate and Roundup did alter the balance of gut bacteria, whereas other studies didn't. So the, the, the evidence was equivocal. Uh, but for us, the actual analysis before our study, which I mentioned was published last week, nobody had actually looked to see if the shikimate pathway in the gut of a mammal was actually inhibited by glyphosate. And indeed, in our study, the most pronounced biochemical change that we saw in the gut of our rats was inhibition of the shikimate pathway. It was dramatic, absolutely stood out like a skyscraper uh, against a flat landscape. Now, did that cause changes in the bacteria? We did see changes in the, in the population of bacteria. Some species actually went up uh, rather than down in the, their numbers. So this was a bit of a surprise because the prediction would have been if you inhibit the shikimate pathway of bacteria, 
those bacteria shouldn't be able to grow very well. And we should see dramatic reductions in certain strains of bacteria in the gut, but we didn't see that. We didn't see this antibiotic effect stemming from the inhibition of the shikime pathway. Um, what, why is that? We think it's because the bacteria in the gut of the rats, which we exposed to the glyphosate in the Roundup, were still able to get sufficient quantities of the essential amino acids from the diet, from the food that the rats were eating. So although their bacteria couldn't produce their own essential amino acids, aromatic, essential amino acids anymore, they were still able to absorb them from the feed. And therefore, we didn't see any antibiotic effect as such in the, in the gut of the animals. We did see changes, and we did see other biochemical changes, which I described earlier. So there were serious worrying changes in the gut biochemistry, but it was not stemming from an antibiotic effect of the glyphosate through inhibition of the shikime pathway. It was through other mechanisms, such as you know, oxidative stress being, being one outcome that we clearly, clearly observed. So um, that's, uh, that's one, that was one thing. Now, that doesn't mean that glyphosate can't act as an antibiotic. I don't want people to go away thinking, oh, it doesn't, it's okay in that regard. No, it just means in the context of where the amount you're ingesting in the context of the diet, the food that the consumer animal or human consumer is eating, it does not act as an antibiotic. It acts as a toxin through other mechanisms. But there could be other contexts in which this antibiotic effect through inhibition of the sheet chemate pathway could be happening. And I believe it could be happening in farm animals. Why? Because they eat an awful lot more glyphosate than you and I. Uh, a, a poultry or cattle, dairy cattle or poultry and pigs, which are in high ra rations, which are loaded with GMO maize, corn, GMO soy, that's, uh, we know from measurements, have very high residue levels of glyphosate. So we know farm animals are ingesting much higher levels of glyphosate than humans. And I believe that this antibiotic effect could happen in farm animals through inhibition of the shikimet pathway. That needs to be tested, however. Yeah. The other area where this can happen is in our soils. Our soils, the microbiome of the soil, which is so important for soil health and for <coughs> plants, for plants, crops to be able to grow healthily, they need a very healthy soil microbiome, soil bacteria and fungi. And, uh, and also bacteria are very important for sequestering carbon from the air into soils to help with uh, mitigating CO, high CO2 levels and, and, and uh, uh, helping to reduce climate, tendency for climate change. I think these areas, this antibiotic effect of glyphosate is where we should be looking in farm animals and in the soil. And we hope to do so in the future. Yeah, I, I think the farm animal thing is, is particularly important because mm. judging from the reports of the farmers that I've spoken to, two in particular, uh, they were saying that the effects of feeding um, GM soy, which is glyphosate tolerant and therefore full of glyphosate, um, in particular to pigs, made the pigs get diarrhea and led to things like bloody diarrhea and uh, all these, these gut problems. So it wouldn't surprise me at all if that was going on yeah. in the farm animals. Sure. And also there's that research by uh, Monica Kruger, who mm. I think is, is in Germany. Yes. And um, she looked at the effects of, of feeding um, cattle. Um, uh, was it glyphosate or was it glyphosate tolerant GM crops? One of the two. Mm. And uh, she found that the, the, the glyphosate actually had the effect of making the cattle more prone to botulism, um, which is a very serious disease in, mm -hmm. in cattle, which I think leads to bloody diarrhea again. Yeah. So, yeah, so we have evidence both from simulation studies in the laboratory, as well as some farm animal feeding studies that shows that there are problems there that could stem from the high glyphosate and Roundup. I keep having to qualify. One thing we haven't touched on yet, of course, is the fact that 
Roundup is not just glyphosate. Roundup is a mixture with other compounds that allow the glyphosate to get into the plant so they can actually kill them. These, these additional substances, they're called, collectively, they're called adjuvants. And these adjuvants are highly toxic in their own right. Our latest study that I mentioned earlier, I, I was saying how we found more dramatic effects from the Roundup that we fed the rats than from the glyphosate alone. Again, pointing the finger that the adjuvants in the Roundup were causing toxicity in their own right over and above or in uh, what the glyphosate was doing alone. So we should be very aware, um, very wary of the effects of these additional substances in pesticides, these adjuvants um, as well, which is another reason to avoid, avoid these pesticides. Because if you've got, if, if you detect a pesticide substance like glyphosate in a food, in all likelihood, you've got all these adjuvants in there as well, which are adding to the toxic effect, which every regulation in the world right now is completely ignoring, I should add. So we are being exposed to toxins that regulators don't care about at the moment. And this for me is, is they're failing in their duty to protect us. I don't know if there's any questions and we've been doing an awful lot. One of more, there's one more question that um, uh, it's about the, um, the, the question of uh, cancer and yeah. are there any cancer markers that um, can distinguish cancer causes like, you know, whether it's from pesticides or GMOs that you know of? Um, not at the moment, no. We, we know mechanism, the mechanisms of action of toxicity of, of pesticides, some pesticides has been studied extensively for many years. Uh, not in both uh, laboratory settings and laboratory animals. And we, we do have some insight into their mechanisms of action. And those, some of those mechanisms, such as oxidative stress that I mentioned earlier, we know can be a, a cancer causative uh, event. Um, but um, that, that's as much as we can say, you know, uh, but we don't have for every pesticide, but for for key, many key pesticides, uh, we do. We do should also remember that cancer, although obviously extreme, you know, extremely serious, is not the only serious chronic disease that can arise from um, exposure to chemical pollutants, uh, uh, including, of course, pesticides. Uh, so we, it could be like some of the things that it could be neurological problems, behavioral problems, it could be type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and behavioral problems such as uh, ADHD and autism spectrum disorder. So we, we, we shouldn't get, I would say, yes, cancer is one, but we shouldn't get fixated to think that cancer is the only problem we face from these kinds of pollutants and these kinds of potential, you know, from these kinds of foodstuffs, the GMO foodstuffs with their added pesticides. We, we, we have our whole, you know, because what's happened in the last 50, 60 years or so is that chronic diseases that used to be extremely rare have become very common. And I'm sorry to say, this is especially in industrialized nations of Europe and, and in the United States. Um, so it's not just cancer rates of different types that have gone, you know, really shot up with now, one in two men and one in three women expected to get cancer. I mean, that's ridiculous. That never used to be 60 years ago. Cancer was rare. And, and, that it, and other things such as type two diabetes, metabolic syndrome, uh, behavioral problems such as autism in, in young children. These were very rare conditions, but they have progressively gone way, you know, in, in the, especially in the last 20, 30 years, they have grown enormously. So something has happened in these years that have escalated the rates of these serious chronic illnesses from the very young to the very old, and, you know, everyone at all age groups. What has changed in those years? Well, the answer is many things have changed. But the one thing that has changed which affects absolutely everybody is the way we grow and eat our food, the way we grow and the way we eat our food. 
and we've gone through an intense chemical based agriculture and we've gone to also eating a huge amount of processed foods that have substances in there that we now know can cause uh, among other things metabolic disturbances including a gut gut microbiome dysfunction imbalance so um this this is um, the, you know the stark sort of big reality that we're facing which is why you know I've, I've been saying for some years now publicly and i will say it again now that pesticides and now also pest gmos and their associated pesticides have for me converted our food into a slow poison it's slow because you eat something and you know you don't feel too bad but over time <clears throat> over time the uh the effects the imbalances in our physiology that these these toxins have eventually build up and lead to chronic illness uh as i say and the very young seem to not need that long the very young are particularly sensitive to uh chemical insults disturbance because they're rapidly growing they're rapidly developing and during time of rapid development there is more opportunity for disturbance from these pollutants and so that's why we see children's illness skyrocketing <coughs> not just in the USA, but, but in all industrialized nations. So we need to take steps to reverse that in our own lives, first and foremost, by avoiding contaminated food. And also, of course, in society as a whole, the world as a whole. Uh, have you noticed any um, changes or ripples from Bayer's purchase of Monsanto, um, where Apparently, Monsanto was less than open with Bayer about legal lawsuits regarding glyphosate levels and stuff. Sorry, Stephen, I didn't quite understand that question. It was about the, the recent purchase of Monsanto yes. by Bayer, and yeah. that because Bayer is a European Union corporation, yeah, have there been any ripples in Europe that uh, from this that have uh, that you've noticed? Um, not that we've noticed recently. Um, the, I mean, Roundup, even though we don't grow glyphosate-tolerant crops in Europe, um, Roundup is still used widely to clear weeds in different agricultural settings and is very popular in domestic settings, uh, rural urban settings as well. But I haven't, I haven't noticed, we, what we have noticed, I suppose, is at least here in England, and I believe on the continent, are brands of Roundup that don't have glyphosate in them, <laughs> which may, have, may sound like a contradiction, but there's at least two, two types of Roundup on the market here in Europe, and I, I see it in my local grocery store, which has, the label says glyphosate-free Roundup, and it has um, a thing called pelagonic acid in it, which is, um, something that uh, it's a it's something that is extracted it's an actual extract from is it plants yeah uh, and which when you spray it actually kill will kill a plant um, and another type has uh, acetic acid in it what we have in vinegar well I you know actually if you spray vinegar on weeds it will kill them anyway yeah. by the way it doesn't need a, it doesn't need the adjuvants and the well it's <laughs> you know that's interesting because Sheila Reeves, professor Sheila Reeves Serralini who has done research on the GMOs and their associated pesticides. He actually has, has written a paper on these glyphosate alternatives, the, the pelagonic yeah. acid ones and, and the acetic acid ones. And what he did was he, he looked at um, the contaminants, some of the contaminants, and also they have adjuvants in added ingredients. And uh, there is a lot of concern, he has a lot of concern about the toxicity of the adjuvants and also the toxicity of the contaminants. And in some cases, glyphosate was actually present as a contaminant in these so-called safe weed killers. But anyway, he also did a little study to find out um, whether just spraying the weeds with vinegar worked as well. And he found out that it actually did. So he said, um, save your money. Don't, don't go to the garden center and, and buy the acetic acid roundup. 
uh, just use vinegar. It has the same amount of acetic acid in it and you won't be in danger of getting exposed to the adjuvants or the contaminants. So apart from that, I'm not aware of the, the, the person was asking whether we've seen a shift since Bayer bought Monsanto and all the lawsuits have come along, no, has there been a shift not. in Europe? But I would say apart from these small market shifts, there hasn't been a shift in policy. The only policy change that has happened actually, which we are um, feel is very good, a very good beginning at least in the, in the Roundup area, a Roundup market area is, is that one class of adjuvant that has been found to be particularly toxic. They're known as polyethoxylated taloamines or POEA for short. Actually, my, the person working in my lab, Robin Menage, he's been studying these adjuvants for many years. And he was one of the very first to show how these POEA adjuvants were incredibly toxic, a hundred times or more toxic than just glyphosate alone. And all his, this work, is slowly filtered through to the regulatory authorities here in Europe. And the European Union has now banned the use of the POEA class of adjuvants in Roundup formulations that can be sold within Europe. The, round, the glyphosate, can, there's no restrictions on glyphosate use, but the adjuvant use has shifted to supposedly uh, safer um, adjuvants. Now, Having said that, of course, there haven't been any studies to show how safe these alternative adjuvants are. Ours last, the paper we published recently, we fed our rats a Roundup formulation with a class of adjuvant that was supposed to be to, assumed by regulators to be really safe. And yet we give low amounts of this to our rats and they still showed signs of ill health. So, and so we hope they take note of our evidence because they didn't have this before, that these alternative adjuvants are still toxic, even if you give small, small quantities to them and for long enough. Um, uh, question, some questions. Does glyphosate come out of the body fairly quickly? Does taking mm. glycine help with that? And the question I know you know the answer to, does uh, as Stephanie Seneff uh, states, does gly glyphosate substitute for glycine? I've read your paper and I know your answer. <laughs> yes, thank you, Susan. Um, the, the, from the, some, there's been some studies that have looked at how quickly glyphosate passes through the body. There aren't that many studies there, but um, from the studies that have been conducted, um, we, um, the glyphosate that enters the body, the, the body does exit pretty quickly, such that in, in one study where rats were given one, one large dose of glyphosate, and they found that after seven days, 99% of the glyphosate had exited through the urine and the feces of the rats, but 1% remained behind, and that was mostly in bone. So this is, so there's two sides to this observation. Yes, probably we do clear the glyphosate from our bodies quite quickly. So if we went on to an organic diet, and this has been shown by the way, in published studies, if we shift to an organic diet, our glyphosate residues in our body, where before, because of what we've been eating, we'll be topping it up every day, will drop fairly dramatically quite quickly. Um, can you help with the clear out by ingesting glycine? I don't know, and I would doubt it, to be honest, because it gets out pretty quickly anyway. Whether you would accelerate that with glycine ingestion, I'm not sure, because uh, I don't think the two don't overlap in their functions where one is going to displace the other. And that leads me to the third part of your question. Does glyphosate substitute for glycine in proteins? This was a hypothesis that was put forward by Stephanie Seneff and Anthony Samsel some years ago. And even though there was no, it was a, a reasonable hypothesis because glyphosate 
is a derivative of glycine. And they thought that it could possibly um, exchange. But although there was there's no, no direct evidence for this, um, at the time when they proposed this possibility as a mechanism of toxicity of glyphosate, uh, because the idea is that if glyphosate substitutes for glycine in proteins, and gly glycine, you know, that at many positions, it would cause the proteins to misfold. And therefore, the function of the protein would be disrupted or destroyed, and you get, you'll end up misfolded non-functional proteins accumulating in your cells, and that would be toxic. So you know, it's you know, if that was true, that would be very worrying. So, but there was no direct evidence for this, uh, in at least in mammalian. Uh, there were experiments conducted in bacteria clearly show that there was no substitution. Uh, some quite good experiments uh, conducted where you grew bacteria in the presence of high concentrations of glyphosate. There was no evidence at all when they analyzed the protein. There was no evidence at all of that gly glyphosate substituted for glycine in the proteins. But there was no evidence uh, from whether this could happen in mammalian, animal or human situations. So, so a few years ago now, we decided in my lab to test this hypothesis because nobody else seemed to be doing it anyway. <laughs> so we, we, grew, we grew human human cells that happened to be a human uh, breast, cancer, breast cancer cells. We grew them in the absence and presence of a, quite a high concentration of, of glyphosate. And we grew it at a high concentration of glyphosate. So the amount of glyphosate in the medium in which the cells were growing was slightly higher than the amount of glycine. So we didn't want the glycine, more glycine to be there. We wanted, to, we wanted the glyphosate to be slightly, you know, have the edge, the slight edge over the amount of glycine in the mix so that we, you know, we, we gave it the, the best chance of being able to get incorporated into proteins in place of the glycine. And we grew these cells for six states, so quite a long period of time. Continuous growth in the presence of glyphosate. The cells, the first sign that nothing bad was happening and probably the substitution was not taking place was the fact that the cells were grew absolutely fine. The cells grew in the presence of glyphosate just as well as in the absence of glyphosate. But okay, anyway, maybe there were low levels of substitution that were not affecting their overall biology. So then we extracted the proteins from these cells and we did what's known as a proteomics analysis where we look at the full spectrum of proteins in the cells. Uh, their, their protein struct, the protein amino acid sequence. And we selected candidates, um, s s candidate protein fragments to look to see if their weight, you see, if the, the glyphosate is a heavier molecule than the glycine. So if the glyphosate gets incorporated into the protein fragments in place of the glycine, their weight would increase quite substantially and, and, and very readily detectable by the methods that we use, which is known as mass spectroscopy. And at the end of all of this analysis, the result was very, very clear that the glyphosate was not substituting for glycine in the proteins of these cells grown for six days in the presence of quite a high concentration of the glyphosate. It was very, very clear. Um, and um, so it was, that was it, you know, the, the, the hypothesis was valid, we tested it, and it's just not correct. And um, we, and, and that's really the, the, uh, the, the bottom line on that mechanism. Glyphosate, that doesn't mean to say glyphosate isn't toxic, of course, we've been discussing all the other mechanisms through which glyphosate makes herbicides are toxic. So we, these are solid science behind all that. So we don't have to go down this a speculative route of glyphosate glycine substitution, because um, actually it's just, not, it's just not happening. Well, I really appreciate your presentation. Um, we are 
over the allotted time. So if anyone has some last minute questions and if you have the time, raise your hand. And if that doesn't happen, we wanna thank you profusely. I mean, for example, in autism, it used to be one out of 2,500. Now some studies say one out of 26 boys. My suspicion is there's a whole toxic stew and pot out there, yeah. including GMO, including yeah. glyphosate, including herbicides, including electromagnetic fields, including mm -hmm. all the stuff people put on their face to smell good or whatever. And that this toxic soup, that the best chance we have for our health is to avoid these and take any steps toward detox. So I want to thank you for all your research because genetically modified foods and glyphosate is such an important factor and what's bombarding our health and what's making people increasingly sick. For example, youth used to be one out, 18% would have a chronic disease. Now it's over half yep. and many have more than one. The I right. of optimal health is 27 and then it's downhill. At least when I went through, I mean, the age when it starts going downhill. I hope we haven't reached it yet, but anyway. Um, <laughs> anyway, so what you're doing is so important and I wanna thank you profusely. All right, thank you. Let me also you. second that and say, uh, I hope that you enjoyed this as much as we did. Oh, we, we really did indeed. Did. We thank really, really so did. Much. Thank you very much. And we hope the audience today um, got a lot out of it. Um, and I hope, but what we hope is that we hope we've inspired people to actually go out there and and um, take care of themselves better and take care of their loved ones better and just get the message out really because it's only through individuals rising up to this challenge that's that's going to change the system for the better for everybody so i hope people have been inspired to take matters into their own hands so to speak and because uh, we hope we've armed you you know we've given you reference what we hope we've done here we've armed you with the knowledge to go out there and challenge the establishment that all this everything is fine nothing to worry about well, clearly things are not fine. We've got so many sick people and there has to be a reason. Perfect, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you as well very much and all the best everybody in the USA and we hope to be able to visit you again soon and then <laughs> sometime in the future. We've really missed our trips to the USA. Uh, well, but hopefully it'll be possible again uh, sometime soon. And I'll be coming your way again in the summer. Oh, great. great stuff. We must get, hopefully, at least by then, we'll be able to meet in person. <laughs> At the moment, we couldn't, but hopefully we, could. we can by then. <laughs> okay.